If you will, please turn with me to John chapter 2. John chapter 2 this morning. John chapter 2. And if you'll turn with me to the 12th verse of John chapter 2. John chapter 2. One of the best things that we can do as Christians is to read the whole Bible. If we read the whole Bible, it's going to keep us from making a lot of mistakes in life. We're going to see an example of this. What do most people today think of Jesus? They think of Jesus basically as this weak-wristed man with long hair in the first century who just walked around about two or three feet off the ground, levitating the whole time, never became hungry, always spoke very nice, and would never offend anybody. That is a common conception of who Jesus is. And one of the things that will alleviate that misconception is simply to read the whole Bible. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but just think to yourself, how many of us here have read the whole Bible at least twice in our life? At least twice. At least once, but at least twice. Uh, and what you find is most of our problems in our life, first of all, the way that we live, the way that we act, comes from what we believe. If I believe it's okay to murder, I may go out and murder. But I, if I believe it's a command of God not to kill people, but to love people even, that's going to affect the way that I live. When we read the whole Bible, we see, yes, we see the love of God, we see the mercy of God, and that is a highlight of the Bible. But then we read over here, like in the Psalms that we saw a couple weeks ago, we see the wrath of God and the anger of God. Did you know the Bible says that God is angry with the wicked every day? The Bible, we know this and we thank God for this. The Bible says that God loves sinners. We praise God for that. And still, on this other side, the Bible would teach that God is angry with sinners and would say even stronger words than that. What we need to do as Christians is to read the whole Bible. That will keep us from many, many errors. And we have an example of this today here in John chapter 2. We've been looking at the Gospel of John. We've seen in this first chapter about who Jesus is, how great He is. We've seen just a glimpse of how wonderful this God is, God who came down to take on flesh, to live like we live. He became hungry. He became tired. He slept. And He became angry, too. Not in a sinful way, but He became angry. And we're going to see that today in our passage. Let me just say this. I know we have some, some visitors with us, and we're so glad for that. The Gospel of John can be read in this light. In the 20th chapter of John, John says, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you, might, you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. That is the reason John wrote this book. So what we see from that is every story in this book is meant to build our faith. If you're a Christian this morning, this story about Jesus is meant to build your faith up, to make you stronger. If you're not a Christian this morning, this story about Jesus is meant to show us who He is so that we may be saved, believe in Him, and be converted. Let's start here in verse 12. After this, he went down to Capernaum. Now, of course, he's just turned water into wine, the first 11 verses of John chapter 2. And now it says he goes down to Capernaum. Now, actually, Capernaum is in the north. So why does it say going down? Because he's leaving Cana, which is elevated higher, and therefore he's going down. We're going to see in just a minute that he goes up to Jerusalem. And what that means is Jerusalem is elevated. It's a city set on a hill. So you go up 
to Jerusalem to get there. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples. And they did not stay there many days. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand. Now this is one of at least three Passovers that John mentions in his Gospel. He may mention four, but at least there are three by name that he mentions in his Gospel. Jesus ministered for three or three and a half years. This is the first Passover that He goes to. And of course, when you read about the Jewish Passover, you're reading about the celebration of the Jews when God delivered them out of Egypt. You remember the story? We've known it from Sunday school, and we thank God for that. The people of God are in Egypt. They're in slavery. God has sent nine plagues on Egypt to to make Pharaoh release them. Pharaoh has not done that. What happens? is this. The Bible tells us that God tells Moses to get a lamb, to kill that lamb, to put the blood on the doors. And when the death angel comes by, if the blood is on the doors, the death angel will pass over and you will not die. The Egyptians had firstborn die. The people of God did not though. And this is a a remembrance, a celebration of the Passover meal. And we've already learned in the first chapter that Jesus Christ Himself is the true Passover. He's the Lamb of God. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And He found in the temple... Now listen to this. And He found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. I want you to notice at the very outset of this passage, the problem is not that people are selling things. That was a courtesy. You've got people traveling from miles and miles and miles away. They couldn't bring their sacrifice with them. It's a courtesy. It's a good thing. You've got people there. They're selling these animals. It's a convenience. They come, they buy the animals, they have the sacrifice there, they're ready to offer it. That's nothing wrong with that. You have the money changers here. What are money changers? Basically, the money changers, at least in part, were people, they would come, of course, you have people from all around coming to Jerusalem. It's Passover time. And they're coming all around with different types of money. And many of them are wanting, at least the males above 20 years and older, they're wanting to pay the temple tax. So they bring their money. They don't have the right coinage. So they bring their money to the money exchangers. They put the money there, and the money changers give them the right kind of coin to use for the temple tax. It's very similar for you if you go to a different country. You've got American money. You have to go get that exchanged for the money of that country, the currency of that country. Basically the same thing here. It's nothing wrong with what they're doing. It was a convenience, and they're just making things easy. You know, we have our sermons on the internet, hopefully have video here very soon. That's a convenience. There's nothing wrong with that. And yet, this was the problem. Verse 14 says, and he found in the temple. That's the problem in this passage. These people, it wasn't wrong to sell these animals. These people, it wasn't wrong to exchange money. What was wrong is they're doing it in the temple. That's what's wrong. And he found in the temple. Now this is the heart of Jewish worship, is the temple. You've got the temple, and what you see in the temple is the place. This is the place in the Old Testament where God's presence was especially at. This was the place where people would come and they'd worship God. They'd bring their sacrifices into the temple to offer sacrifices for their sin. They would pray. Now when it says in the temple here, we shouldn't think that they had all this commotion going on in the holy place. Especially the most holy place. That's not what's going on. 
It's the temple complex. It's, you've got the temple. You've got the holy place. On end, you've got the most holy place. The Ark of the Covenant's in there. Yes, but around that, you have diff- the complex. You have the, the place for the Gentiles. You have the place for women, etc. That's what's going on here. And they have all these things in the place where people are supposed to be praying. Listen, it's hard to pray with animals making a commotion. It's hard to pray and worship when there's business going on everywhere. Just like if you came here this morning and all you're thinking about is your work tomorrow or the work you just left, it's going to be hard for you to worship today. It's going to be hard to. You may have Gentiles there. They can't go too far in. But they have a place there. And they're selling all... And you think about the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people who are coming to Jerusalem. And all the animals they needed. There's no room to pray anymore. There's no room to worship. And as we're going to see, Jesus says, You have made my Father's house a house of merchandise. A house of market. That's the problem there. Verse 15. When he had made a whip, now we have to have room in our theology, don't we, for whip making. When Jesus Christ came and made a whip, and when he, when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers of money and overturned the tables. This was the Son of God coming into His Father's house and He is going to cleanse the temple. You know, some of you may have heard of Leonard Ravenhill, the famous preacher who died back in the 90s. Leonard Ravenhill said, if Jesus came back today, He wouldn't cleanse the temple. He cleansed the pulpit, is what He said. You better believe that's true. I want you to listen to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. If you remember from the first chapter in John that we've looked at, John the Baptist is prophesied of in Malachi chapter 4. And yet in Malachi chapter 3, what we have before us may not be the full fulfillment, but at least we have a fulfillment here of what's going on. Many believe, as well as I do. Malachi chapter 3, listen to what the Bible says of Christ. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord, now listen to this, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the Bible says. The Lord whom you seek will come into his temple, the Bible says. Even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And look what verse 2 says. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. It says when Jesus Christ comes, my friends, He's going to be like a refining fire. And that's what you have here in the temple. Christ comes. He cleanses the temple. He's refining the people. Verse 16. And He said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make My Father's house a house of merchandise. This is God's house. Don't make it a business here. Don't do that. And then verse 17. Then His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever get zealous for the things of God? Do you ever see the blasphemies happening in the name of worship? And the blasphemies happening in the name of God, in the name of church? And does that ever upset you? It's good to be upset by that. Just like when you watch the news at night and you see some corruption happening, you see some evil happening to a child, you see some evil happening to a widow, that should make you angry. I can tell you this, it makes God angry. It makes God angry. 
Now here's what I want us to look at for a minute. I want us to see what this temple cleansing of this day means for our day before we go on. What does it mean here? Jesus has come to the temple. He has come. No doubt the authorities are there. The Pharisees are there, no doubt. The Sadducees are there. And what happens is they, Jesus comes in. He's an outsider. You remember he, His ministry has just begun. He doesn't have a reputation yet. Later on, about three years later, Jesus will come into the temple and cleanse it again. The other Gospels will let us know that. But this is the first time He cleanses the temple. He comes in. He, he takes the whip. He drives out the people. He cannot stand. Now, now don't, don't get the wrong opinion. Jesus doesn't lose control. He doesn't go crazy. If that would have happened, the Romans would have come in and, and had order. Yes, He had a whip, but Jesus Christ was under control still. Driving people out. Righteous indignation He was doing. And what I want us to see this morning, one thing that I want us to see is this. When you look at this passage... Don't take this passage and try to make it fit this church building here. Now my friends, we are blessed with a nice church building, aren't we? I thank God for this church building. And we have such a nice church building and I believe things should look nice. I believe it should be serious. I mean, we're here to worship God. It should be a joy-filled seriousness, but it's still seriousness. It's joy and gladness, but it's real. We know that God is here. At the same time with that, don't look at the temple here this morning and say that this is the temple. Because this is not the temple. I want us to see two things in the Bible that are called the temple in the New Testament. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians with me. Chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 this morning. How does this apply to us today? Jesus cleansing the temple. What does that mean for us today? First Corinthians chapter three. Look in verse starting in verse sixteen. Do you not know that you are the temple of God? Now this is speaking about the entire church. Like we are gathered today as a church. This is speaking about when we gather together today as a church meeting, we are the temple of God, is what the Bible says. This church, listen, I, I, like I said, I love this church building. We need to keep it up. But if after this service we all walk outside and this church building collapses... Next Sunday, this church will meet under the trees there. When the, if this building collapses, the church doesn't collapse. We are the church. And we can go out and meet in the woods somewhere, or meet at somebody's house, or meet in the, in the social hall. It doesn't matter. We can do that. Do you not know that you are the temple of God? We are the temple of God. And that the Spirit of God dwells in you. It is the Spirit of God that dwells in you and in me and we gather together on a Sunday morning, a Sunday night, a Wednesday night at special times, a called church meeting. We come together. We are the temple of God. God is within us. We are within this building. Therefore, yes, God is within us in this building. But when we leave this building, God is still within us. We are the temple of God. The church at Double Branch is a temple of God. The church at Harmony, these other churches in the area that are true Bible churches, these churches, the people are the temple of God. And God dwells within them. And what you see, as you look at verse 17 now, is that God takes His temple as serious, if not more so, I would say, now than He ever has. We say sometimes, I wish we could go back to the Old Testament and see the great temple. I, you know, the disciples said that, didn't they? And Jesus said, not one stone's going to be left on another. Don't, don't be too impressed with this. These things are passing away. 
My friends, God loves us much more than He ever loved a temple in the Old Testament. Verse 17 says, If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. It pains me and it hurts me to see some of the things that go on in the name of Christianity today. It hurts me. And what we need to see today is a cleansing of the church, a a cleansing of the temple. It is amazing how we see, we see people, and I, I believe in different types of worship music, I believe in newer music, I believe in all of that. It pains me though to see people sometimes with how they go about their worship. Maybe you take a song that's speaking about sin and speaking about high and great things and they set that song to music that sounds like you're at a party or something. Now I believe some songs can be set to that because we are celebrating, aren't we? We're Christians. We're celebrating the risen Christ. Yes, we believe in all of that. But so many times our music, the way that it sounds, does not match the lyrics. We're singing about worship. We're singing about sin. We're singing about how we should be humble before God. And the music does not match that. My friends, we need to be attuned to that and pay attention to that. The worship of God is a joy-filled thing. I hope today when you worship God, you had joy in your heart. All of us should have. And yet it is a serious joy, isn't it? It's something that's real. Something that's serious within our heart that we feel. We see today, I say the term church discipline, and nobody hardly knows what I mean today. It's unheard of. Almost unheard of. And when you read in the New Testament, what you see is over and over and over, church discipline is taught. And today in churches, in the temple of God, in the temple of God, every type of sin is considered holy. You have adultery, you can, you have people, you can divorce your spouse and still teach your Sunday school class. You can divorce your spouse for no good reason and just walk off and still teach a son. That, that's not in this state. It's in a different state, but I know of that. Nobody does anything. You have people today, I know of one case, it was so sad, a young preacher who got sick and his wife just upped and left him for no good reason. And everything's just okay, isn't it? It's not okay. And I I can say for this church here, we most certainly don't want to be legalistic. I hate legalism. I hate legalism with a passion. But if you here try to divorce for no good reason whatsoever, the church isn't going to stand for that. It's not going to stand for that. Because we love you too much. It's not going to stand for that. If sexual sin comes in, the church, is, the church is going to love you and call you to repent. We're not going to just kick you out. We're, we want you to come and repent and come. Because we're all sinners. We all need... But the church isn't going to stand for that. There's some things that cannot be allowed in the temple. And if Jesus drove out these people from the temple, my goodness, how corrupt are many temples today? They're corrupted with sin, aren't they? They're corrupted with sin. Sexual sin. So first of all, what we see in this passage in John 2 is it's not this building that's the temple today. It is the church of God that's the temple. We are the temple of God. Here's the second thing I want you to see. Just turn over a few more chapters in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Not only, not only are we the temple of God when we meet together like this. Not only is that true, but we are the temple of God when we're individually by ourselves. That's what this passage is teaching. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, start in verse 18. It says, "...to flee sexual immorality." Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. So if you are here today and 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 you love God and you're a Christian, but you fall into sexual sin, the Bible says you're sinning against your own body. 
So in one way, sexual sin is even a worse sin than just simply lying to somebody and simply hating somebody. As bad as that is, sexual sin is an even worse sin to commit. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We have been bought by God. God has put His seal upon us. He has filled us with His Holy Spirit. And He has given us life. And we individually are temples of God. That means that we need to be very careful of what we allow in our temple, don't we? The things we see on television are coming in. They're influencing us. The things that we are listening to are influencing us. All these things are influencing us. The things that we allow our children to do, the see, not see, these things have a tremendous influence on our children. We see all these things going on in life. We ourselves are the very temples of God on earth where God dwells within us. This is serious, serious thing. Ezekiel 36. Go ahead and turn back to John 2, but I'm going to turn to Ezekiel 36 and show you a promise from the Bible. Ezekiel chapter 36. You know, some, we, we may hear teaching like this, and again, this is, this is why it's good to hear the whole Bible. You may, be, you may have heard what I've said right now, the last few minutes, and you feel condemned in your heart because you know you're not as holy as you ought to be, and that God is going to cleanse you out like the temple. Now listen, if we're in sin, we should feel condemned. If we are in sexual sin, we must feel condemned so we can repent. If you can go and do whatever you want and feel just fine about it, that is the most scariest place to be in life. Is a place where God no longer speaks to you about. And yet I want us to see this promise. We are the temple of God. Ezekiel 36, starting in verse 25. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. This is, speaking, this is speaking to the Jewish people in context. Ultimately, it's speaking of the new birth though. God, later on, it'll say that God puts His Spirit within us. God changes our heart. He makes us the new people. His good Spirit now is within us. But what I want us to focus on is verse 25 for a moment. It says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness. Now you may be here today, and you know, just like I know, all my filthiness is not cleansed away. I tell you, I, not that I had a bad week, but I had, I had some struggles this week, just to be honest with you. Struggles I don't care to mention right now. And, and, I, and I had to come to God, and I have to deal with those. Listen, I'm not, I'm not completely pure. My goodness. But this promise right here is saying that for us who are Christians, for us who are the temples of God, God is going to cleanse us from our filthiness. For us who are Christians, the Bible says that God is going to cleanse us from our idols. And when God saves us, He doesn't do that all of a sudden. It's a process of time. So you are here just like I'm here. We have our own struggles. We have our own faults. The grace, of, if, if we are Christians, the grace of God has come within us and God has begun this work of transformation in our hearts. And we're like John Newton who wrote Amazing Grace. He said something like this, just like the Bible, I'm not what I should be, but I am what I am by the grace of God. God is continually cleansing us from our idols. He is continually cleansing us from our sins. 
I'm not the same person I was 10 years ago, and I thank God for that. Now, I've been a Christian now probably for 14 years or so. But when I was a new Christian, I didn't know which way was up, which way was down. I didn't know. I didn't know what was going on. Honestly, I didn't know what was going on. I was saved. I loved God. I was not trained up in one sense like I ought to have been. I, I wasn't reading the Bible like I should have been, but God had saved me. God had done a work in my heart, and God from that point on has begun the cleansing process in me. If I have wronged someone severely in my past, I need to make that right. If I have done something severe in my past, I need to go and correct that if I can. But the truth of it is, God continually works in our hearts. God continually has to cleanse this temple of sin and filthiness and corruption. But one day we will be a pure temple. Do you believe that? Amen. We will be a pure temple one day. Now back in John chapter 2, Jesus has come to the temple. He has cleansed the temple. He has done a great work. He has cast it out. Now look in verse 18. So the Jews answered and said to Him, What sign do you show to us since you do these things? Now isn't that enough? It shouldn't have been enough that He cleansed the temple. Isn't that enough? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the Scripture and the word which Jesus had said. What you see is this. Jesus comes, He cleanses the temple. He makes a big scene. The disciples know. They think back to Psalm 69, verse 9. The Jews come to Him and ask for a sign. What sign do you perform? And Jesus says, if you tear down this temple... I'm going to raise it up in three days. One of the things you see there is this. Jesus Christ is saying to them that He, in fact, is the true temple of God on earth. Again, the temple in the Old Testament was the place of sacrifice. It was the place where people came to pray. It was the place that people came to worship. They brought their sacrifice, the cleansing of sin. And what we find in Jesus Christ today is that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Jesus Christ offered Himself as the sacrifice. Jesus Christ is the place where people meet with God. And after He was resurrected from the dead, the Christians believed that. And they believed in who He was. And I would say to us today, we've looked at this passage, I would say to us today, have you come to believe this about Jesus? You see Him cleansing the temple, you see Him coming, you see Him casting out people that shouldn't be there, casting out things that shouldn't be there, you see Him making this prediction that in three days He's going to rise from the dead, and in three days He does after His death. Have we come to believe this about Christ. And if you have walked in here as an unbeliever or somebody who has backslidden from God, if in our hearts today that we will come to God and believe this about the Lord Jesus Christ and trust Him and what He's done for us, if we will do that, and at the same time, if we have come here, we're backslidden, we're away from God, if we will return ourselves to God and give our hearts afresh to God, Jesus Christ will forgive us of any sin and any wrongdoing that we have done in our lives and return and cleanse this temple. So this morning, if you have not trusted in Christ like this, believe that He is the one who is to come. It's our prayer this morning that you will find a, in your heart the ability by God's grace to turn to Him and to trust the Lord Jesus Christ.